Equal Protection Clause from Wikipedia, the Free Encyclopedia, http colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org. This article is divided into an introduction and nine sections. Introduction The Equal Protection Clause is a part of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, providing that no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. In the broadest view, the Equal Protection Clause is part of the United States' continuing attempt to determine what its professed commitment to the proposition that all men are created equal should mean in practice. More concretely, the Equal Protection Clause, along with the rest of the 14th Amendment, marked a great shift in American constitutionalism. Before its enactment, the Constitution protected individual rights only from invasion by the federal government. After its enactment, the Constitution also protected rights from abridgment by state governments. Henceforth, they could not, among other things, deprive people of the equal protection of the laws. What exactly that means, of course, has been the subject of great debate, and the story of the Equal Protection Clause is the gradual explication of its meaning. For a long while after the clause became a part of the Constitution, it was interpreted narrowly. During and after World War II, however, the United States Supreme Court began to construe the clause more expansively. During the 1960s, the other two branches of the federal government, the executive and the legislative, joined in as Congress and the President passed and enforced legislation intended to ensure equality in education, employment, housing, lodging, and government benefits. While an expansive reading of the clause was undercut, to some extent, by court decisions of the 1970s and 1980s, the Equal Protection Clause remains an integral part of United States constitutional law. Section 1. Background. The Fourteenth Amendment was enacted in 1868, shortly after the Union victory in the American Civil War. Though the Thirteenth Amendment, which was proposed by Congress and ratified by the states in 1865, had abolished slavery, many ex-Confederate states adopted black codes following the war. These laws severely restricted the power of blacks to hold property and form legally enforceable contracts. They also created harsher criminal penalties for blacks than for whites. In response to the Black Codes, Congress enacted the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which provided that all those born in the United States were citizens of the United States. This provision was meant to overturn the Supreme Court's decision in Dred Scott v. Stanford, and required that citizens of every race and color have full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings for the security of person and property, as is enjoyed by white citizens. Doubts about whether Congress could legitimately enact such a law under the then-existing Constitution led Congress to begin to draft and debate what would become the Equal Protection Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. The effort was led by the radical Republicans of both houses of Congress, including John Bingham, Charles Sumner, and Thaddeus Stevens. The most important among these, however, was Bingham, a congressman from Ohio who drafted the language of the Equal Protection Clause. The southern states, of course, were opposed to the Civil Rights Act, but in 1865, Congress exercising its power under Article I, Section 5, Clause 1 of the Constitution, to, quote, 
be the judge of the qualifications of its own members, had excluded Southerners from Congress, declaring that their states, having seceded from the Union, could therefore not elect members to Congress. It was this fact, the fact that the Fourteenth Amendment was enacted by a rump Congress, that allowed the Equal Protection Clause, which white Southerners almost uniformly hated, to be passed by Congress and proposed to the states. Its ratification by the former Confederate states was made a condition of their reacceptance into the Union. By its terms, the clause restrains only state governments. However, the Fifth Amendment's due process guarantee, beginning with Balling v. Sharp, 1954, has been interpreted as imposing the same restrictions on the federal government. Section 2. Post-Civil War Interpretation and the Plessy Decision The first truly landmark equal protection decision by the Supreme Court was Strouder v. West Virginia, 1880. A black man convicted of murder by an all-white jury challenged a West Virginia statute excluding blacks from serving on juries. The court asserted that the purpose of the clause was to assure the colored race the enjoyment of all the civil rights that under the law are enjoyed by white persons, and to give to that race the protection of the general government in that enjoyment whenever it should be denied by the states. Exclusion of blacks from juries, the court concluded, was a denial of the equal protection to black defendants, since the jury had been drawn from a panel from which the state has expressly excluded every man of the defendant's race. The next important post-war case was the Civil Rights Cases, 1883, where at issue was the constitutionality of Civil Rights Act of 1875, which provides that all persons should have, quote, full and equal enjoyment of public conveyances on land and water, theaters, and other places of public amusement. In its opinion, the court laid down what has since become known as the State Action Doctrine, which limits the guarantees of the Equal Protection Clause only to acts done or otherwise sanctioned in some way by the state. Prohibiting blacks from attending plays or staying in inns was simply a private wrong, provided, of course, that the state's law saw it as a wrong. Justice John Marshall Harlan dissented alone, saying, quote, I cannot resist the conclusion that the substance and spirit of the recent amendments of the Constitution have been sacrificed by a subtle and ingenious verbal criticism. Harlan went on to argue that because, one, public conveyances on land and water use the public highways, and, two, innkeepers engage in what is, quote, a quasi-public employment, and, three, quote, places of am public amusement are licensed under the laws of the states, excluding blacks from using these services, was an act sanctioned by the state. In the most notorious of these cases, Plessy v. Ferguson, 1896, the court upheld a Louisiana Jim Crow law requiring the segregation of blacks and whites on railroads and mandating separate railway cars. The court, speaking through Justice Henry B. Brown, said that the Equal Protection Clause had been intended to defend equality in civil rights, not equality in social arrangements. All that was therefore required of the law was reasonableness, and it amply met that requirement, being based on the established usages, customs, and traditions of the people. Justice Harlan again dissented, 
quote, everyone knows that the statute in question had its origin in the purpose not so much to exclude white persons from railroad cars occupied by blacks as to exclude colored people from coaches occupied by or assigned to white persons. In view of the Constitution, in the eye of the law, there is in this country no superior dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our Constitution is colorblind, and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. Such arbitrary separation by race, Harlan concluded, was a badge of servitude wholly inconsistent with the civil freedom and the equality before the law established by the Constitution. Since Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, 1954, Justice Harlan's dissent in Plessy has been vindicated as a matter of legal doctrine, and the clause has been interpreted as imposing a general restraint on the government's power to discriminate against people based on their membership in certain classes, including race and sex. Section 3. Between Plessy and Brown. Thus, the Plessy majority's interpretation of the clause stood until Brown. However, the holding of Brown was prefigured to some extent by several earlier cases. The first of these was Missouri X. Rel. Gaines v. Canada, 1938, in which a black student at Missouri's all-black college sought admission to the law school at the all-white University of Missouri, there being no law school at the all-black college. Admission was denied him, and the Supreme Court, applying the separate but equal principle of Plessy, held that a state's offering a legal education to whites, but not to blacks, violated the Equal Protection Clause. Smith v. Allwright, 1944, and Shelley v. Kramer, 1948, though not dealing with education, indicated the court's increased willingness to find racial discrimination illegal. Smith declared that the Democratic primary in Texas, in which voting was restricted to whites alone, was unconstitutional, partly on equal protection grounds. Shelley concerned a privately made contract that prohibited people of the Negro or Mongolian race from living on a particular piece of land, seeming to go against the spirit, if not the exact letter, of the civil rights cases. The court found that Although a discriminatory private contract could not violate the Equal Protection Clause, the court's enforcement of such a contract could, after all, the Supreme Court reasoned, courts were part of the state. More important, however, was the companion cases, Sweet v. Painter and McLaurin v. Oklahoma State Regents, both decided in 1950. In McLaurin, the University of Oklahoma had admitted McLaurin, an African American, but had restricted his activities there. He had to sit apart from the rest of the students in the classrooms and library, and could eat in the cafeteria only at a designated table. A unanimous court, through Chief Justice Fred M. Vinson, said that Oklahoma had deprived McLaurin of the equal protection of the laws. There is a vast difference, a constitutional difference, between restrictions imposed by the state which prohibit the intellectual commingling of students and the refusal of individuals to commingle where the state presents no such bar. The present situation, Vincent said, was the former. In Sweet, the court considered constitutionality of Texas's state system of law schools, 
which educated blacks and whites at separate institutions. The court, again through Chief Justice Vinson, and again with no dissenters, invalidated the school system, not because it separated students, but rather because the separate facilities were not equal. They lacked, quote, substantial equality in the educational opportunities afforded to their students. It should be noted that all of these cases, including Brown, were litigated by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. It was Charles Hamilton Houston, a Harvard Law School graduate and a law professor at Howard University, who, in the 1930s, began first to challenge racial discrimination in the federal courts. Thurgood Marshall, a former student of Houston's, and the future Solicitor General and Associate Justice of the Supreme Court joined him. Both men were extraordinarily skilled appellate advocates, but part of their shrewdness lay in their careful choice of which cases to litigate, of which situations would be the best legal proving grounds for their cause. Section 4. Brown and its Consequences When Earl Warren became Chief Justice in 1953, Brown had already come before the court. While Vinson was still Chief Justice, there had been a preliminary vote on the case at a conference of all nine justices. Then the court had split, with the majority of the justices voting that school segregation did not violate the Equal Protection Clause. Warren, however, through persuasion and good-natured cajoling, he had been an extremely successful Republican politician before joining the court, was able to convince all nine justices to join his opinion, declaring school segregation unconstitutional. In that opinion, Warren wrote, to separate children in grade and high schools from others of similar age and qualifications solely because of their race generates a feeling of inferiority as to their status in the community that may affect their hearts and minds in a way unlikely ever to be undone. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. The court then set the case for re-argument on the question of what the solution would be. In Brown II, decided the next year, it was concluded that since the problems identified in the previous opinion were local, the solutions needed to be as well. Thus the court devolved authority to local school boards and to the trial courts that had originally heard the cases. Brown had actually been comprised of four different cases from four different states. The trial courts and localities were told to desegregate with all deliberate speed partly because of that enigmatic phrase, but mostly because of self-declared massive resistance in the South to the desegregation decision. Integration did not begin in any significant way until the mid-1960s, and then only to a small degree. In fact, much of the integration in the 1960s happened in response not to Brown, but to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The Supreme Court intervened a handful of times in the late 1950s and early 1960s, but its next major desegregation decision was Green v. New Kent County School Board, 1968, in which Justice William J. Brennan, writing for a unanimous court, rejected a, quote, freedom of choice school plan as inadequate. 
This was a significant act. Freedom of choice plans had been very common responses to Brown. Under these plans, parents could choose to send their children to either a formerly white or a formerly black school. Whites almost never opted to attend black identified schools, however, and blacks, from fear of violence or harassment, rarely attended white identified schools. In response to Green, many southern districts replaced freedom of choice with geographically based schooling plans. But because residential segregation was widespread, this had little effect either. In 1971, the court in Swan v. Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education approved busing as a remedy to segregation. Three years later, though, in the case of Milliken v. Bradley, 1974, it set aside a lower court order that had required the busing of students between districts instead of merely within a district. Milliken basically ended the Supreme Court's major involvement in school desegregation. However, up through the 1990s, many federal trial courts remained involved in school desegregation cases, many of which had begun in the 1950s and 1960s. American public school systems, especially in large metropolitan areas, to a large extent are still de facto segregated. Whether due to Brown, to congressional action, or to societal change, the percentage of black students attending school districts, a majority of whose students were black, decreased somewhat until the early 1980s, at which point that percentage began to increase. By the late 1990s, the percentage of black students in mostly minority school districts had returned to about what it was in the late 1960s. There are, very broadly speaking, two ways to explain America's marked lack of success in school integration in the five decades since Brown. One way, sometimes voiced by political conservatives, argues that Brown's relative failure is due to the inherent limitations of law and the courts, which simply do not have the institutional competence to supervise the desegregation of whole school districts. Moreover, the federal governments, and especially the Supreme Court's hubris, actually provoked the resistance of locals, since education in the United States is traditionally a matter for local control. The other way to explain what has happened since Brown often has political liberals as its proponents. It argues that the court's decree in Brown II was insufficiently rigorous to force segregated localities into action and that real success began only after the other two branches of the federal government got involved. The executive branch, under Kennedy and Johnson, by encouraging the Department of Justice to pursue judicial remedies against resistant school districts, and Congress, by passing the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Civil Rights Act of 1968. Liberals also point out that Richard Nixon's, quote, Southern strategy was premised on a tacit support of segregation that continued when Nixon came to office, so that after 1968, the executive was no longer behind the court's constitutional commitments. <laughs>